today in Luke 19, we are going to look at what we call a time uh, of the triumphal entry or the Palm Sunday. They call it Palm Sunday because they cut palm branches down off the trees and laid them on the, on the ground. And as we're going to see, they also put clothes on the ground. And so because of that, it's called Palm Sunday. It's also called in your Bible, maybe the triumphal entry. Maybe some of your Bibles say that. Um, it triumphal in a spiritual sense, um, very anticlimactic from a practical sense because the people missed the point of the day. And because they wanted one thing, they wanted what they wanted as opposed to what Jesus was bringing and what Jesus was offering, um, they missed what was really happening. And we're going to see all of that. Um, and it was a, a big day, a spectacular day in a sense, because this was a day that had been long awaited. In fact, all of the prophets had been speaking about this day and, and giving us the, some of the details centered around this day. We looked at a few weeks ago in Zechariah that Zechariah talked about how Messiah, how king would arrive in Jerusalem. And Daniel told of when the king would arrive in Jerusalem. And, and uh, Isaiah and, and even Daniel again and, and even Jeremiah and others, Hosea, different ones talked about what would take place with the king in that final week when he would arrive in Jerusalem. And so this was a big deal. Um, the other gospels tell us is that while Jesus was approaching Jerusalem as he was getting close, I think it's Mark's gospel that says that something happened with Jesus. And as the disciples observed him, they became amazed, one verse says, one part of the verse, and then they became afraid. And it, it seems as though as they approached Jerusalem, Jesus himself his, in some way, his demeanor actually began to change. It says that he went out in front of them and they were amazed and even afraid by what they were observing. And what was Jesus doing? What was Jesus thinking? Well, Jesus knew he even said to them in that same passage, I'm not going to turn there, but he actually told them again, what was going to happen? The disciples were not listening. They were thick headed like many of us are. I'll raise my hand. Hey, bro, see, we're just being real in here. We're going to get delivered today because we're honest. <laughs> Thick-headed. And, we, and so as they didn't get it. He told them, but Jesus realized that this would be his last time traveling to Jerusalem for Passover in his earthly ministry. Because in this particular week, this final Passover week in Jesus' life on earth, he was actually going to fulfill the picture of what Passover was all about. As John said, that he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. So Jesus was going to actually be the Passover Lamb, and he would actually lay his life down that those who believe on him in faith would be free from sin. And he was going to defeat, he did defeat death, he did defeat the grave. And so in his resurrection, we have this hope now of eternal life, and it's alive in us. It's not a, it's not a weak hope, it's not a a hope as we think of hope, it's a real living hope because it's been birthed in us when we became born again. And every Christian has it. Don't even realize it. They get it more and more as they walk with him. In other words, those of you who have the spirit in you this morning could probably say amen to the fact that you long for something greater than what we can find down here. And it's to be with him. And so that's what we're headed to. And so all of this was about to happen as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. But in all of that, on his way in, in uh, Luke chapter 19, he stops to show us this little dude named Zacchaeus. And you got to think about it. Why on earth are we even getting this? And everything that was taking place, why on earth does the Holy Spirit even take the time to explain the life of this little guy named Zacchaeus anyway? Why does it even matter? Except the Holy Spirit needs us to see something about the power of the presence of Jesus. And, 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 and even that power that's here today, that power that will be at the auditorium at JCC on next Sunday, and we see it in, here in uh, Luke chapter 19, if you whip me in verse one, say amen. amen. It says, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. He's getting close now to Jerusalem. And now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich and he sought to see who Jesus was. 
but he could not because of the crowd and he was of short stature. So here's this little short dude, probably looks like Danny DeVito. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit stops and pauses for us to look at this. That blows me away. What do I learn? What do you learn from this scene? The Holy Spirit wants to show us in this historical account what's taking place and what we can take from it. First thing we know about Zacchaeus is Zacchaeus is not an ordinary guy. He's a chief tax collector. And when it says he was rich, that's an understatement. Because these tax collectors, they, the chief tax collectors, that is, they would, if you will, bid to win these tax levies over a certain region. And they would promise to collect the tax for Rome. And Rome didn't care what they collected on top of that. So if Rome were to say for this region, we need a $10 million dollar tax levy on this region. So the chief tax collector would agree to collect that, but anything extra that he collected was his and he would probably share it with the tax collectors that work under him. So let's say he, he collected 1.5 million or sorry, 15 million of, of the 10 million, the 5 million would be something he would keep and he would get a cut to his tax collectors that work under him. So he was a chief tax collector um, and he's going to even admit by his own mouth to Jesus that he's cheated folks. So what you have is a chief thief who is the overseer of other thieves. And because of that, he has become very wealthy. But that wealth came with a price because he's a Jew. And so because he's a tax collector and he's a Jew, they saw him as a traitor to the nation. He sold out for Rome and he was hated by his own people. And this is why I remember with the 12 apostles, Matthew was a tax collector. How many of y'all remember that? Matthew was a tax collector, which was an issue. The other apostles probably didn't like Matthew at first. And it's a miracle that Simon the Zealot didn't slit Matthew's throat in the middle of the night and kill him. But it's a miracle because when Jesus gets a hold of us, we shift even how we view one another. It's amazing to even begin to see how the Lord works in our lives and changes us. So here's this guy who's wealthy. He's a chief tax collector. And all of a sudden, Jesus is coming to town, and he wants to see who he is. Why? Because he's heard of him. He's heard. Now, everybody had heard of Jesus and heard he was a man of God. Remember Nicodemus tells the story? We know you're a man of God. Nobody can do the miracles you do unless they're from God. Nicodemus went to meet Jesus. Y'all remember that? So Zacchaeus knows him, and this, is a, this man must truly be of God. And he's not like those Pharisees. He's not like those Sadducees. He's like a real dude. Like people talk about him talking to them and laying hands on them and healing them and teaching them out in the middle of nowhere and, 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 and serving fish sandwiches and stuff. This dude is different. And I got to see this for myself because I'm sure like us, Zacchaeus, his life was unfulfilling. We had this discussion Pastor David and Pops and I right between services, you know, because down here, the things that we think are going to bring us happiness and joy that we work so hard for, then we obtain them and realize, man, I worked so hard for that and it doesn't cut it. It's not solving this, this issue on the inside. You know, there's still a longing. There's still a, there's still a, a, a lack going on. And so pay, uh, people who don't know Christ keep searching for more. They try drugs. They try alcohol. They try sex. They try um, you know, racing motorcycles, jumping out of planes. I mean, anything to get a fix and none of it, none of it actually works. And you got to go higher in a plane. You got to get a faster motorcycle. You got to get stronger drugs. You can do all of that stuff and it's going to end you up right back in the same empty place. So here's the kids, a wealthy man, hated by the nation, but Jesus is showing up and he's just got to see who he is. I got to see him for myself. I can imagine the Zacchaeus thinking, man, this guy's coming my way. I got to see him. And I like the fact that we even see a little bit about who this man really is. It says he could not because of the crowd and because he was a short stature. So he's a little dude. You know, one thing you know about little guys, little guys are usually pretty tough because they have to be. <laughs> <laughs> and so he's tough, he's smart, he's had to figure things out. He's a chief tax collector, so he's a leader, he's a, he's a go-getter kind of guy. So what does he do in verse 4? He ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. So, so Zacchaeus is not a follower of people. He says, hey, he's coming, 
forget the crowd. He's got to go this way, so I'm going to go down here and get in a tree and so I can get a good glimpse. You know what I'm saying? It's like he's the guy like that shows up real early for the parade and gets a good spot along the way and sets their chair up and then, you know, fight anybody to get in front of them. He said, I want to see Jesus. So he prepares himself. Listen, he prepares himself and he positions himself to see Jesus when he passes that way. I think that one of the things that we need to take into consideration is there could be Zacchaeus this morning. There probably will be next week at the, at the uh, JCC. And we should strategically plan for them and pray for them that, that they, would, they would get a good place along the way, if you will, to be able to see him. Because the reality is, is that many of us in this room can relate to Zacchaeus. And you could be here this morning and not be saved, not know the Lord. Uh, your life is not fulfilling um, and you can't find anything that actually does fulfill it. And so like Zacchaeus, you need to kind of position your heart right now to not be hard hearted, but to say inside, Lord, if you were real, Lord, if you could come by my way show me something real this is the reality of it so Zacchaeus is he's there he's ready it's verse 5 and says and when Jesus came to the place I love this when Jesus came to the place man Jesus has a way of coming to that place in your life like he did in mine in 1993 it was the perfect place and the perfect time when I needed to come to know him personally. And he showed up. And this is the scene that we're sitting, <clears throat> we're getting as we look at this. And so when he came to that place, notice in verse 5, Jesus looked up and he saw him. And this is one of those times in the Gospels, I believe, where Jesus is using his divinity. And sometimes he would do that. You know, Jesus would be going through the crowd in another gospel. I think John tells it best probably. It says that the crowd was so tight, it was, they were thronging him, meaning that it was so tight, everybody was bumping each other. Y'all remember like pre-COVID days when you go to the state fair and everybody's bumping each other. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says, somebody touch me. And the disciples are like, are you for real, Jesus? <laughs> everybody's touching you. And Jesus says, no, virtue just went out of me. And heals somebody. Somebody touched me by faith. And he stopped and he knew it. And he turned around and it was the woman with the issues of blood. Y'all know what I'm saying. And so Jesus gets to this place. And, you know, his, his God senses are up, if you will. Whoa, somebody is here by faith. See, that's the crazy thing about Jesus. Right now in a room full of people, Jesus knows that, hey, somebody came here this morning by faith. Somebody is listening intently by faith. They're not just going through the motions. There's something going on. And by faith, they are listening. He knows who you are. And that's the beauty. I don't have to know who you are. I want to know who you are. But I can by faith trust that he knows who you are. And so because of that, he, look, he stops basically. And he looked up and he saw him and noticed what he said. Zacchaeus, because I know Jesus. So when I read through the Gospels, I try to put the Jesus I know in there, not just reading the words, you know, and commas and periods. He didn't just say Zacchaeus. He looked up, Zacchaeus. He was happy. Zacchaeus, in all of eternity, this moment, this time, this place is yours. He says, Zacchaeus, make haste, come down for today. I must stay at your house. Can you imagine what happened at that moment in the heart of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus is like, what? You know, how do you know my name, first of all? You know, and then and so he comes, look what it is. So, so he made haste and he came down and, and received him joyfully. Now, you got to catch this scene. Because this is, this is one of those eternal moments when a person comes to meet Jesus. And there's this reception happening. I believe they're both joyously receiving each other, you know, but the problem is with religious folk. And when we read the rest of this, I need us to put ourselves in the position of the crowd. Those of you who are born again this morning, we need to put ourselves there and we need to learn from it. So Jesus and Zacchaeus are having their joyous come to Jesus salvation moment basically is what's happening. Jesus, you know my name. Jesus, you know me. Jesus, you want to spend time with me. Can you believe that? And yet, everybody else is going to act towards it a different way. Look at it. Verse 7 says, but when they saw it, they all complained. 
hold on, Jesus. Here we are, you know, waiting for you to show up and be king. We ready to get behind your political agenda. You know, we're going to be on the Jesus party. We're going to put your sign in our, in our driveway and, and on our bumper sticker. We team Jesus now, you know, and then hold, hold on. You, this dude ripped me off. I lost my business last year because of Zacchaeus. Collecting taxes I, that I didn't owe and I couldn't pay. Took all my stuff. And you're talking about now you're going to go hang out with him? They got issues right now with Jesus, right? They missing the point because they're being selfish and they want things the way that they want it, which is a lot of times the reasons why we miss the things that God is doing. Just like the Jews missed Christ coming the first time because they didn't want the, the Jesus that showed up. They didn't want some dude from Galilee that's a carpenter. They wanted a conquering king to come the first time. And so they missed what was going on. And we can't be that way. We can't be that way in this time. We can't be getting distracted by politics and political stuff and what's going on in the world and all of this kind of stuff. You know, what, what if the drag queen who wants to go dance in, in kids' schools, of which we can't stand, but what if there's a day coming where Jesus is passing by and all of his gay drag queen stuff, which has not fulfilled him, because the one thing we know is that it will not fulfill him. Maybe there's a day coming when Jesus is going to stop and look at him. And we got to understand that. And so it says here in verse 7 that they complain saying he is going to be the guest with the man who is a sinner? What are you doing, Jesus? That's not cool. That's not what we do. We don't do that. Come on. No, you come down to the church with us. We don't do that kind of stuff. And then Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, and here's the, here's the point. While all of them are complaining, Jesus is looking Zacchaeus in the eye. And Jesus says to him, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. We got to understand what he's saying here. In the second part, he says, and if... I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Now, he's newly saved is why he put the word if in there. The reality is he stole, okay, and he understands it. But it's okay because Jesus knows the language. He understands. Well, in other words, his heart's breaking for Christ, and he's like, I'm going to get, because all this stuff I got, I stole it anyway. <laughs> That's what he's saying. <laughs> and it ain't satisfying me. So I'm going to give this stuff away to the poor as much of this as I can, and, and, and I'm going to restore fourfold that which I stole by false accusation. And, and this is an amazing scene. We can't even believe this. I mean, it's hard for us to fathom. This dude is talking about giving millions back because he met Christ. People do that kind of stuff. The Lord changes lives. And so Jesus responds and says to him, as we got we to move here, and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And notice what he says, because he also is a son of Abraham. And when I first read that as a Gentile, I'm like, well, I do understand that the gospel is for the Jew first, but it, then it also says then to the Gentile. Y'all remember those verses? So what is he getting at? Is he saying that salvation has come to his house because he's a son of Abraham, because he's a Jew? No, no, no that's not what he's saying. In other words, he's saying that salvation has come to his house because he's proven he is a, 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 a son of Abraham because of his faith, because the scripture tells us, and we see it several times, Romans 4.16 says, therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, Paul talking to uh, a, a Jew and Gentile mixed church there in Rome. Just like he said to the region of Galatia in Galatian 3, 7, he says, therefore know that uh, only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. How can you say that? What about the ethnic Jew? But the Bible says, no, Abraham is the father of faith. And those who come by faith, we are the sons and daughters of Abraham. Because it, like Abraham, we have likewise sought after the Lord. In other words, you can't fulfill the law and it's got nothing to do with your religion or your mama or your grandmama religion. Amen. It's got to do with you having faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And once that's there, he receives you. Amen? Amen. So he also is a son of Abraham, just like we are in this room. And notice he says in verse 10, for the son of man, check this out. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Beautiful words. Jesus says, 
this is my mission. I've come to seek and I've come to save that which is lost. And do you know Jesus is still seeking and saving that which is lost? No, he chooses to do so, though, through working through his body uh, mostly. He's put his Holy Spirit within us, which we're going to look at next, and he's called us to this ministry that our life, our example, our even love for one another, he is uh, using and being able to work through those things to seek out and save that which is lost. And so what you got to do is you got to imagine in a scene like this, you do not want to be in the crowd complaining when a tax collector is getting saved. The implication of him getting saved is economy, the economy just changed. <laughs> they don't even realize it yet. The whole economy just changed because the tax collector got saved. So next year he ain't cheating nobody. You know, he might even quit being a tax collector now. You know, but the whole, the reality is these are the things that happen. Now, now this is a side note I didn't mean to talk about, but when, revi- when true revival begins to take place, um, cultures change. Whereas before the revival, everybody's complaining about what's going on, complaining about what's happening. But when the revival actually breaks out, people get saved and change under the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can't clean up the outside and want to change how people look and all that kind of stuff. You know, and people can get so offended. I mean, we've had people get offended through the years in church just because somebody got tattoos. Man, I don't care about your tattoos. I care about you knowing Christ. I don't think, I think he's going to wash them off us when we get up there. I mean, you know. <laughs> In the resurrection, they get burned up somehow. I don't know. But the point, the point is, man, when you, how many of y'all went to the Jesus Revolution movie a few weeks ago? You got, we got a glimpse of how this whole Calvary Chapel thing actually started, you know? And, and so we got we to gotta say, wait a minute, Jesus is trying to seek and save that which is lost. We caught up dealing with, you know, issues that won't even have eternal value to them. We got to look beyond it all so that maybe they will have a place in time where they get to see who Jesus is. And that's something we need to be mindful of. Now, Nate's part of this historical account, verse 11, says, now as they heard these things, he spoke another parable. Now, you got to catch this, though, because he's got to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, which means that they didn't immediately go to Zacchaeus' house. So now this criminal dude, this tax collector, this politician, if you want to compare him to uh, American culture, Um, this dude now is hanging out with Jesus the rest of the day. You know, this little short dude is down. Now he's rolling with Jesus in the 12. Now it's like, now it's 14 of them. You know, it's like, whoa, this dude just went from being who he was to now walking with Jesus and looking at the amazement that's going on. His heart's changing already. He's already calculating in his mind how much money he got to give away because he's been a crook and, and all of this. And he gets to watch the whole scene. Can you imagine that? And then it says that when he heard this, he began to speak another parable. Now, remember what a parable is. We can look at it a couple of different ways. It's a heavenly, excuse me, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's a way for Jesus to take something that they might can understand and relate to in order to give them a true spiritual picture of the kingdom because Jesus is the best teacher that's ever walked the earth. So he knows how to do that. And so he's going to, do, to give a parable. Why does he teach in, in a parable here? What it says, because he was near Jerusalem, number one, and because they thought the kingdom of God would come, would appear, notice, immediately. So they have no clue what's about to take place. It's almost like they didn't even read the scriptures because the scriptures told them when he would come, how he would come and what he would do. But they wanted to ignore all of that because they just want they just want to be free of Rome and have the kind of kingdom that they want right now. So they're not they're not prophetically, biblically literate as to what all that was going to take place. And Jesus didn't want to leave them in that state. So he wants to make sure they have an opportunity to understand what the real kingdom looks like prophetically and what the timing of the real kingdom is going to be because it's not about to come the way they want immediately. We know that. And it's amazing to me how Jesus desires to reveal to us um, as much of his plan as possible so that we could have the right outlook. So because of that, he delivers this parable and it says, therefore he said a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and return. Jesus could stop right there and we could understand the parable already. We already get it. Whoa. Jesus is is using this parable of this nobleman to show us what his life and timing is going to look like now. Because 
Jesus is kind of that nobleman, if you will, who is going to go into a far country, and there he's going to receive a kingdom, that far country being heaven, and it's there where he will receive a kingdom, and he'll bring the kingdom back when he comes. Well, wait a minute, though. Didn't he say that we should pray uh, that kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? Isn't the kingdom supposed to be on earth? Why does he go to a far country to receive a kingdom? Well, what's going to happen is that Jesus is going to receive the kingdom while in heaven with the Father, and then when he returns to earth, he judges it and he establishes his kingdom, and he has a, a thousand year Sabbath rest and then eternity. And that's good news. Well, wait a minute then. When does he receive the kingdom in heaven? Well, the Bible gives us that picture in Revelation chapter 5 when he takes the scroll out of his father's hands and begins to open it and judge the earth. At that moment, he's received. Now, even though when he was here before he left, he says, All authority has been given to me. But for now, I got to go back to heaven until I receive the kingdom. Even later in the book of Luke, um, a few chapters from now, it's going to say, I believe it was uh, 20, verse 43, over there, um, verse 42. Chapter, you can glance ahead. Chapter 20, it's on the screen too if you don't know how to get there. Chapter 20, verse 42, it says, Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said, this is Jesus quoting it, said to my Lord, Interesting language, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, he says, David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? Jesus is pointing to them and saying, hey, David is saying the Lord said to my Lord. Because Jesus is the offspring of David, but he's also the king, the Messiah, and the Lord of David. And David was prophesying of the father saying to the son, hey, come chill with me on the right side of my throne. Till I make your enemies your footstool, until I bring the culmination of all the rebellion on the earth to one final battle, and they become your footstool as you'll return and destroy them and establish your own kingdom. So Jesus is telling this parable because he wants them to have a clue that, hey, the kingdom's not about to happen right now. So let's go back to the parable. Y'all okay? Amen. All right. We're running out of time. Let's move quickly. So. This, this nobleman, he goes away to the far country to get his kingdom. He's going to come back. Verse 13. So he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. Minus being a point of currency. Do business till I come. In other words, he's distributing uh, to them various things and saying, until I come back, you do business. The family business is to glorify God and win people to him. Verse 14. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. Now, there are some historical implications to that region that might have sparked some attention in some of the people. But the main point that we don't even have to know that to get the parable. Some of the citizens don't want him. They're going to reject him, um, which is about to happen in this Passion Week. We know that. Verse 15. And so it was when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. In other words, he gave them some money and he wanted them to be stewards over it and to bear some fruit. So he came back to inspect how much fruit you got. Now, I'm from a farm, so I think in terms of how many bushels are on the back of the trailer. When I get back to the house, my granddad wants to see how many bushels did you bring back? How hard have you worked with, with how, you know, with what? Anyway, I'm sorry, all this went there. <laughs> Verse 16, they, they then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said, well done, good, good servant, because you were faithful and very little, have authority over 10 cities. Interesting picture. We do know that we will rule and reign with the Lord in the kingdom. So therefore, because this servant had been faithful with that, the illusion here is that he's going to make him ruler over much more of his kingdom. Verse 18. And the second came saying, Master, your mina has earned five minas. Likewise, he said to him, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, and by the way, both of them got rewarded for what they did, even though the one didn't, didn't produce as much as the other. Because when we think about the parable of the talent, which is different, but it says there that he gives each one according to their ability and their judge only according to their faithfulness. I love that. So the Lord distributes based on ability because we all got different abilities. And I, I, don't ha I may not be able to handle as much as Mondrick um, in, in my ability, but if I'm faithful in what I can handle, I'm going to get rewarded just the same. You follow me? So God is good that way. And so verse 20 says, then another one came saying, Master, your mina, which I have, I, uh, your mina, here is your mina, rather, which I have kept put away in a handkerchief. So he received it, he wrapped it, and put it away. And now he's returning it. 
For I fear you, because you are an austere man, you collect where you did not deposit and reap where you did not sow. And he said to him, out of your own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was austere man, collecting where I did not deposit, reaping where I, have not, where I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank that at my coming, I might have collected it with interest? So he rebukes him. But if you notice, he doesn't do away with him. Verse 24, and he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to him who has 10 mina. But he said, excuse me, but they said to him, master, he has 10. He already got 10. Why are you going to give him more? Hmm. Interesting picture. He doesn't do away with the guy who didn't do anything with it, but he did take what he had and put it, give it to one who is a better steward, someone who can be faithful and, and, and produce with it. Interesting. Then he says, for I say to you, verse 26, that to everyone who has much, who, who, excuse me, to everyone who has will be given. And from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. It's a stewardship thing. Um, now, verse 27, he says, but bring here those enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. Hard for us to deal with. But we got to get the picture. It's a picture here. What is Jesus saying? Hey, I got to leave. All right. I got to go get a kingdom. One day I'm going to return and establish my kingdom here. But I'm leaving my servants, my body here to uh, and I'm, I'm giving, I'm distributing to them. And what we have received from him is the Holy Spirit um, and the resources that he puts within our stewardship. And I want you to glorify me basically and, and, and do the family business until I return. And he's only concerned about faithfulness. And so you had two, two examples, one with 10, one with five, both faithful, got rewarded. One who did absolutely nothing. He was, it was lukewarm, if you will, at best and did nothing but what the Lord had given him but waste time. And from him, it will be taken and given to one in the kingdom who has been faithful, even though he still makes it into the kingdom. The ones that were destroyed was the ones who have rejected him all together. He gave us a picture of what the last 2000 years have been looking like. And then he's coming back. All right. We got we're So actually, my time is up and I'm just getting to the triumphal entry. Y'all ready? <laughs> OK. All right. Here we go. Verse 28. So when he had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem and it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, which is at the foot of the Mount of Olives on the other side, um, at the Mount called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, um, where as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat, loose it and bring it here. Very simple, clear instructions because he's talking to disciples. And sometimes as disciples, you can't give us too much. Got to be very clear, very simple because we're thick headed. So Jesus is being very simple here. And, and they probably not even realizing that they about to be involved in what Zachariah was talking about in chapter nine. But it goes on to say, and if any, he says, if anyone asks you, why are you loosening it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. And so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said, but as they were loosening the cult, the owner said to them, why are you loosening the cult? Now, let's stop for a moment, because this is this is how it goes when you really get into serving the Lord. When you really begin to participate in this adventure of being a, a born again believer, having the Holy Spirit in you, knowing the word of God and you begin to serve him in your life. He sends you on these adventures, these errands that will kind of it kind of challenge you a little bit because you got to imagine here's these guys going, walking over to this village. They see it. They get there. It happens just like he said. OK, because he's Jesus. That's typically how it goes. If he tells you it's going to go this way, that's how it's going to be. They see the donkey. And now they got to think for a minute because I don't believe they just immediately went and grabbed the, the donkey. I imagine they're thinking, man, this are you sure we should do this. Right. We Galileans. Down here, obviously, this is a wealthy person to be able to have probably a, a, some land and, and a donkey tied there. And we go into jail. <laughs> That's basically how this is going to go down. Jesus doesn't set us up. We go into jail. <laughs> if we do this, we're going to jail. But we can't not do it because Jesus is going to know that we didn't do it. We can't get back and say, Lord, we didn't find the donkey. <laughs> D that ain't happening. Jesus is going to be like, come on now. 
So what are we going to do? We're going to jail if we lose this donkey. They're probably talking through this thing. I guess, I mean, Jesus is going to have to come supernaturally get us or he's going to send Judas to come bail us out because they didn't know Judas was stealing the money yet. You know, so he'll show up and bail us out. What are we going to do? We got to trust Jesus. Here we go. So they go to get the date. They, they, they like, man, they go to get the donkey. They untie him. And the owner, the owner says, what are you doing? Dang, here we go. And they're looking at each other because the answer they got to get is a faith answer. It makes no sense. You know, so people want to justify, well, Jesus made arrangements last time he was coming through. He did. He made arrangements five, six hundred years earlier when Zechariah said that rejoice, daughters of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming lowly and riding on a donkey. That's when the arrangements were made. So they had to say, the Lord has need of him? Okay, go ahead. It's like, man, he's like, they, now they're walking back with the donkey. Like, you see that? We should be in jail right now. This is the kind of crazy stuff that happens when you're following Jesus. He arranges things in your life and he uses them to test your faith and strengthen your faith as you trust him. And so they take the donkey. They're probably blown away as they're walking back. They're talking. They're excited. Like, I can't believe this happened this way. And they get back. And it says, um, and they said, Lord, the Lord has need of him, verse 35. And so they brought it, him to Jesus and they threw their clothes on the cult and they sat Jesus on him. And notice it says, and as they went. So Jesus is going to actually ride now into Jerusalem on this donkey. Remember it said no one had ever sat on the donkey before. How many, anybody in there ever tried to do this before? <laughs> yeah, you get on a donkey that no one's ever sat and you're not going to ride in any kind of straight line. <laughs> You're not going to make it to any kind of predetermined destination. He doesn't want you on his back. He's going to buck you and go in circles and try to get you off. What are you doing? I don't want you on my back. And so in this whole historical scene, other than the Lord Jesus himself, I love the donkey. If I could insert myself in, I would choose to be the donkey. Because he's the only one in the story that actually knows what's going on and is fully submitted to it. He probably looked up. He probably leaned his head into Jesus, licked him. This is my creator. I get to be the one of all creation to take the Messiah into Jerusalem at the appointed day. To the donkey, the donkey rides right in to Jerusalem. Jesus probably loving on him a little bit, rubbing his little head and all, and, and uh, just comforting him. And that, 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 that donkey has no care in the world right now. He is in the presence of his creator. And it says they went on their way. So as they went, many spread their clothes, verse 36, on the road. Then as he was now drawing near to near the descent of the Mount of Olives, coming over now. So now when you begin to come over, then on this path, the whole view of the city would have been there. And the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. They had seen many miracles that the Lord had done and they're beginning to praise him. They're excited. They even began to sing the song that they would normally sing at Passover anyway, the Messianic Psalm, Psalm 118, where you know they say Hosanna in the other gospels. Here they quote the part that says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And so they're singing these things, but they're dedicating this now to Jesus. Because they're excited. The conquering king is coming. Yeah, he's on a donkey, but that's okay. He's going to conquer and overthrow Rome, and we're going we're gonna to be okay. So they're excited. But look at verse 39. But some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. What are they saying? Well, they're saying, you know that they're singing a song that's meant for Messiah towards you, and you need to rebuke them. Notice Jesus' answers, verse 40. He answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in Psalm 18. In other words, this day was the most prophesied, looked upon day, one of the most looked upon days coming up until this point. And he's saying if they didn't worship him in that way, the very rocks would cry out. And this is Jesus, the creator speaking. So he knows how he would have made those rocks cry out. How do rocks worship? I don't know. But he would have made a rock concert if the people didn't open their minds. 
And those rocks are still there in Jerusalem to this day that would have cried out somehow because Jesus would have made them do that. Or the, actually the father would have in honor of the son. It's amazing. So now as he, you know, and this is the thing is I, before, I, I'm, I'm about the end here in a second. But the thing is we don't ever want anything to cry out on in place of us we're the ones created to worship Jesus in the way that we do and we should never ever fail to do that almost done give me a few more verses 41 through 44 y'all okay it says now as he drew near he saw the city and he wept over it um now when I when I look at this word weep I think it's an unfortunate translation it's a weak word in the in the English and I don't think the Hebrew is implying that um, in fact, I was telling first service, I feel real free, so I'm doing stuff I wouldn't normally do. But I opened up, during first service, I paused and opened up in my blue letter Bible on my iPad here, the, the Hebrew word for it, and I'm going to push play and let you hear it. It's not going to play this time. It would happen that way. Well, I don't know why. But the word is this. Let me give you the definition. So that it, it means to mourn in a, in a, in a way of lamenting. Okay. Um, it actually, as those who mourn for the dead, actually. Okay. Because I know what weeping is. I've been weeping. And I understand mourning. Now I've come to learn, understand a little bit of what lamenting is. And actually, it means to weep and be well for. Be well, and I've discovered what that's like. You know, I'm kind of a quiet guy. I'm not uh, overly dramatic, and so I don't yell unless it's football season. Now, my kids would tell you I probably yelled through the years, um, but that's understandable at times. Um, but I generally, other than that, I don't, I've, learned, I've learned to yell when I'm by myself. Let's let it out because there's pain that you can't contain sometimes. And so when we, we look at this word, this word is an un... Uh, Unfortunate translation, in my opinion, into the English. Um, g- literally, and in, in, in some of the other scholars would, would, would say, and if you, if you think about it, Luke, who investigated this, is trying to tell us that Jesus was wailing, he was crying out, he was convulsing when he saw the city. Why? Because he saw something that they didn't. They looked and said, look, we got this magnificent temple, it's Passover, we're, 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 we're doing well. We're on top of the world in some sense. You know, yes, there's Rome, but man, look at what's going on here. And Jesus sees a city that's going to be destroyed. Forty years later, as Rome would destroy that city and many people would die, many people would turn to cannibalism. It would be burned to the ground. And then not only that, when Jesus would begin, when the Lord would begin to initiate the, the last days by causing the Zionist movement to start, and the Jews began to go home. Um, then Satan raised up his Antichrist dude who led the Nazi party to kill six million of them. There's actually a story called Sing a Little Louder. And it's a true story where as the Jews were being put in trains and taken to concentration camps, there was a little church and the train would come right by the church and they would hear the crying of the Jews and that would be in those train, those, those railroad cars. And instead of doing anything, they just sung a little louder. That's why it's called that. And they went to concentration camps and they were gassed and killed in horrible ways. And so Jesus looks at the fact that this was a day that could have brought in, if you will, the kingdom. But they rejected him as a whole. You hear people singing and rejoicing, but the leadership the nation has rejected him. And Jesus knew he was going to be rejected because he's God. But in his humanity, because he was 100% God and 100% man, he had to be a man to pay for our sin because he had to be kin. He had to be a kindred redeemer. So in his humanity, he is completely heartbroken at this moment. So verse 42 says, he said, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. And he actually tells us what I just described to you. For the days will come upon you where your enemies, meaning Rome, will build an embankment around you, A.D. 70, 
surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, he says that you shall see my face no more until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as a, as a nation who now knows their Messiah. Not just quoting Psalm 18 because you want something different, but really desiring to know me as your Messiah. And that's when you will see me. And so the thing that we can take from this today, because look, here's the thing that's coming. There's a day coming when he returns where the remnant of Israel will cry out. And he will come to them, Isaiah says, as he comes from the east and he will meet them in the part of the wilderness where they have been hidden for three and a half years, that last part of the tribulation period, second half of it. And he will bring them to Jerusalem with him as he returns and puts his foot on the Mount of Olives and it will, the earth will quake and it will split. And, and we know that that day is coming. And so the thing that we need to understand is that we need to not be like those who missed him the first time, whether you're a Jew this morning or you're Gentile, what we need to understand is Jesus is Jesus. I need to be okay with who he is and how he wants to do things. I don't need to project what I want on him. I just need to follow him and be ready when he comes for me. Because look, whether you die or you are raptured at this point, the one thing is for sure, he going to gather us all in the air one day and we will be with him for all eternity at that point. And that's what we're longing for. That's what we're looking towards. And so this entering into Jerusalem is just part of the story. This, this historical event that has taken place is something you need to be reading every day this week. You need to read the rest of what took place and all of the things that happened historically in Jerusalem during that week. You got four gospels and, and, and six days to just enjoy yourself until we get together at JCC and, we've, and we look at the finality of this thing when he rises from the grave next Sunday. Amen? All right, let's pray. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you today for allowing us to be here. We thank you for um, just being faithful to us, Lord God. I, I ask that you would consider each person, that you would go before us this week, Lord God, to, to just lead us, to guide us, to give us the spiritual gifts, discernment, words of wisdom and knowledge. The Lord, help us to navigate this world you've called us to occupy until you come. I pray that you would uh, allow us to, um, to just follow you, to serve you, to love one another. Until we see you, until we gather again, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing.